Hello, everybody, and here we are at episode 88 of What is Truth? The orbital, orbital period of Mercury, 88. 88 keys on a piano. And so, uh, in a sense, that could be seen as an admonition to have an appreciation for life. And that's the fly in the ointment, so to speak, of the, of the plans of the adversarial powers. And uh, so we're going to explore some of that today. Unannounced to David, by the way, but I have been sending him things previously. I, don't, I, I haven't had a chance to ask him if he'd even been able to get through all the things that I've sent him. So that's, that's the serendipity effect. So today is What is Truth, part 88, and I'm John Barnwell. I'm here north of the city of Detroit, Detroit, the Straits, and I'm here with the Reverend David William Perry in the city of London in merry old England at times. And uh, how you doing there? I suppose I'm frying to death like everybody else, John. Um, yep, lovely to see you again. Another another Sunday afternoon. Um, a severe weather warning has just been issued by the government. Um, um, yeah, it might be a little more complicated than people think, Oswald. It might not be a yay or a nay thing, John. You have to you have to read what you're referring to, or the people that aren't watching just listening. Oh, Oswald Spengler has just said 88 episodes, and I'm still not sure I know what truth is, what gives. Truth is our Lord Jesus Christ. Period. The end. Read the Bible. There we are. Sorted out. Um, <laughs> although, of course, there are layers underneath all of that, which might take a long time. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the the most astonishing thing today is that cobra have been summoned uh, by the now powerless and floating about prime minister um i i'm trying to think what would would have been my grandparents reaction to having the committee responsible for national security summoned because of a severe heat warning <coughs> um I, th I think they have been absolutely flabbergasted uh, but nevertheless, uh, that is happening. There are rumours of death and doom just about to hit us tomorrow. I um, mean, it's about 38 now in London, pretty, pretty hot. Um, it's the, curiously the type of heat I'm used to. Um, if you go travelling in Central Asia, you have to get used to certain types of heat pretty quickly. So um, it is debilitating, it is draining, but you, you learn sort of tricks of the trade and how to survive. It's meant to be 40, 40 tomorrow. Uh, it breaks all the records. Absolutely severe heat for us, but, you know, there will be deaths, sadly, uh, probably amongst the elderly. No one's prepared for a thing as usual. And this country trundles on from disaster to disaster, as is its want, I despair. But how is it? Is it hot or cold over there, John? Uh, it's beautiful, and uh, it, but it's been uh, not enough rain, really. You know, the, you check out your phone, and it says, oh, it's going to rain tomorrow, and then tomorrow comes, and then you just check on your phone, and it doesn't say it that anymore. <laughs> so uh, perhaps it's the, the uh, weather control technology getting in the way of our precipitation helping to bring on some kind of drought or something who knows who knows what evil will do uh you know you mentioned boris and uh he's not the only person uh, there's been numerous people in recent times within uh positions of leadership in, in various nations that have uh, abdicated or been removed or all of that. I mean, what there's the Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi, uh, and, but it's it's interesting because they they share something in common, 
and that's that they're, they're in support of certain uh, projects, shall we say, of NATO. And uh, like, uh, what, last month, the Prime Minister of Estonia, uh, Kaya Kalas, expelled the popular center-left center party. You know, that's, that's a big thing. Uh, and then you get into Sri Lanka with Kotabaya Raja Paksha, who supported those endeavors. And he emailed his resignation after he left the country. <laughs> so, uh, and, and what happened to Shinzo Abe of blessed memory and uh, these weird turn of events for uh, our own uh, guy standing, uh, standing in for the White House and Trudeau and Macron, they're all going through a bad time as they say. And so there's, you just have to wonder, you know, uh, the, the old adage is the new boss, same as the old boss, you know, but uh, I have a feeling they'll be worse. What say you? Uh, I, you know my rule of thumb. I try never to talk about other countries because I, you never know what you've missed. You never know what fact is lurking around the corner or beneath the surface. I can say a great deal, however, about Britain. Um, John? Well, that, that goes on the basic premise of our show here is that we're, we're trying to, striving to work with the open set. We assume we don't have all the information, so we're we're just giving uh, our best approach at, at what we can see. Um, the American situation is bewildering. I'll just leave that there. Um, um, and, and so is the attitude of some of our friends and colleagues. Uh, uh, to, to let me say this as a blank statement to everyone we know now. Neo-feudalism is not a good idea, and I will oppose it with every last breath I can take. A lot has happened since those days. It was corrupt back then and ruled by fear and violence. The end. You're not talking about Leo, are you? I don't know what you mean, John. All I'm saying is I don't think neo-feudalism... You can't go to a country like America and start talking about neo-feudalism. Anyway, all I'm saying is... I don't think that's the solution, with deep respect to everybody. Um, um, you know, we, we've got to think of ways forward, not ways backwards. Um, in Boris's case, I mean, you know, it's hard to think of a single redeeming feature. Um, you know, I, I'm i basically of a libertarian persuasion. Um, it struck me early on in the so-called Brexit debate. There wasn't really a debate. There were people throwing around facts, half of which were, were lies, stats, half of which were lies, and never really engaging, and no one was mentioning freedom or liberty. So I was suspicious of that enterprise from the beginning. Um, you know, so what are we meant to, you know, what are we meant to do? We choose between a, a gang of criminals in Brussels or a gang of criminals in Westminster. I, I'm sorry. You know, why is that the only choice? Why is that the only choice? So, I mean, of course, I remember saying to all of my friends, a lot of whom were into Brexit, this will end in a total disaster and we'll end up paying more and under more control than ever. And surprise, surprise, and I hate saying that, but that, that's what's happening. Uh, and Boris is one of the worst. He's one of the worst. You know, Bare-faced liar who will do anything to defend his career. Um, is that, you know, all the people are worth? Of course not. Um, will, will his replacement be better? No. You know, I said, so let's look, let's think of the other side of the chamber. So, Sir Keir Starmer, some of us feel uncomfortable with the fact you've got a title and you're representing the opposition anyway. Some of us feel uncomfortable with that. It's time to embrace that, Keir, baby. Um, but, you know, would he be any better? No, he'd be comparable. So, you know, what, um, my trouble with Westminster is they've all been to the same schools. They've all been to the same universities. They've all practically done the same degrees. But, you know, 
Um, this this is no way to represent anybody in a system even pretending to be democratic, although I don't think it's pretending that anymore. <clears throat> We've got to find, you know, why do people, it, uh, I don't know, perhaps that's the 70s hippie in me coming out. Why doesn't anyone want to rebel anymore? Why doesn't anyone want to strike back? Why doesn't anybody say, you know, enough's enough, and we're finding our own ways of dealing with things and alternatives, which, of course, was a big thing in the 70s. <coughs> Excuse me, you get the, you know, the projects like the Fendhorn community, which, of course, I visited, so I know there was magic there. You get Arcasanti, eco-cities being built by mystical uh, architects, Paolo, Paolo Soleri, I believe. Um, where has all that gone? And why... Why is it the millennials, and I'm a bit harsh on them, but only because I think they're interesting. Why is it that they've been conditioned? How is it that they've been conditioned, both how and why, uh, so effectively into thinking this is just the way life is? That wasn't, that's not from my generation. It's certainly not from my parents' generation. And, you know, and it, it's beat the fight. It's beat the struggle. Out of all of them, I can't understand that. I can't understand uh, Paul Logan, um, who one minute is in a boxing ring and the next priding himself on spending millions on an original Pokemon card. Grow up. Get a grip and grow up. I can't understand any of it. And it, it strikes me that these are reactions to an increasingly potent system that is playing a very, very clever game, almost on the level of black magic. Um, that's not a phrase I want to throw around, but it's an appropriate phrase. Um, the level of deception on that type of level, I think, is obvious. And a great spell has been put on humanity, and on the young in particular. I mean, I, don't, I still don't think it's our generation that are going to be attacked in the end. I think there's an absolute war raging around the young, but it it frightens me about who's winning and the way that they're winning. They're removing possibilities. The powers that be are removing possibilities uh, and thoughts of freedom, thoughts of standing your own two feet, self self reliance, uh, you know, getting on with your own life. All of that is being removed and being replaced with the, the drone mindset. Where uh, you know you're <clears throat> you're the drone in the anthill, and you should be lucky to be in that position. I, I hope that doesn't sound too <clears throat> excuse me fateful. I mean, I don't believe this will probably start an argument. I don't believe that the great literary magnates of recent history were insiders in the sense that David Icke keeps saying. Um, just because clever people are good at anticipating. Events doesn't necessarily mean they're commanding events. Uh, and 1984 is one of my favourite novels. Uh, people tend to forget, you'll know this, John, that originally the title was going to be 1948. Um, and, you know, it was basically what a British socialist thinks of Stalinism. I mean, that's what's behind the novel. And, you know, I mean, wherever Orwell is now, you know, he, his glittering spirit is saying something along the lines of, did I call it or what? You know, um, because he wouldn't have dreamed things could get this bad or this far. Um, the scene that stays in my mind, then I'll pass back to you, John, uh, is that when, I mean, there are a couple of scenes that are just immortal scenes, is when uh, O'Brien clearly says to Winston, you know, the, the guy that's trying to rebel in his own little way but not doing too well at it. You know, can you imagine, Winston, the the, the future is one of my soldiers' boots stamping on a human face forever. And that is what we're beginning to face when our expectations are so low, when our freedoms are being reduced or redefined in front of us and nobody's fighting back. And the whole cloying system is basically designed to remove any pleasure, any sensuality, any transcendentalism, anything that might make us actually human. Uh, if ever there was a time for an anthroposophical surge saying, um, we really stand for something better and we stand for something more. Did you know that Guido von Liszt was the next generation down from Rudolf, uh, was 
uh, Guido von Lisch knew about Rudolf Steiner and Rudolf Steiner was the generation down from him in all of those undercurrents. Isn't that interesting? And it shows that these things can, these revolutions can burst out and take a thousand different colors and perspectives. By the way, I just finished reading uh, the Rune book by Guido von Liszt. What an absolute education. What an insight into the early, early days of German revival and German romanticism. <clears throat> but you can't help feeling a lot more than that in the sense that that was a revolutionary book in that time and that place, which must have benefited people on far-reaching sides of what came to be a very depressing... Thank you. Thank you, Agatha. Thank you. Uh, cloying system, love it, David. Thank you. Um, you know, of what came to reach a, a very serious debate. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, the, the fact that uh, I believe Steiner talks about the, the black swastika and the white swastika, how one's going right the right way and the other's spinning in the other direction, or I might have been misled on that, but I thought he did. Um, so you get Steiner saying, look, there's great good in this reservoir of new energies, this huge good. And of course, his opponents who were channeling and working with the dark counterbalance of all of that. And, you know, what worries me is the dark counterbalance almost seems more credible at the moment than our wonderful Rudolf Steiner, who stood for the light, who stood for the bright and human progress, and says, yes, there is power and there's truth in some of these ideas. Are we going to use them to our betterment? And nobody did apart from anthroposophists. We need to take our rightful place in history, John, and that time is now. I don't understand that remark. I don't understand much any anymore either. I don't understand that. <laughs> so, yes, I had my sound off. Yeah, so it's that whole idea of uh, what what has happened. What's this big transition? And if you look, you see that the with the birth of television, that there's a shift of attention away from nature toward this cathode ray that's pointing right at you and beaming into you your instructions for the day, even though you might have just been watching Wagon Train or old cowboy movies and cartoons. Nonetheless, you're still, you, you've entered into a relationship with subnature that was non-existent. Uh, before that time. Uh, well, of course, it gradually came in with radio and all of that, but that's not as intimate, shall we say. Uh, there's, there's continual uh, incursions by the Luciferic forces of imm immateriality and the harmonic forces of materiality, especially in our time. It's that uh, time in which uh, I've spoken on many occasions that Rudolf Steiner had indicated that November of 1879 was the Michaelic uh, force that was able to uh, drive down the, the spirits of darkness. The only problem being is that now they're down here and they're, they're looking for human hosts, people that will express into the world the way they they would wish is the idea and there's another interesting point in history where rudolf steiner speaks of of these things uh, of course there's uh, numerous places where you could make tie-ins but this is very i think telling for what's going on shall we say and it has to do with the spiritual disillusionment for the luciferic and harmonic powers and it was a lecture that Rudolf Steiner gave in Dornach on September 24, 1916. And it's in uh, Collected Works, Volume 171. Uh, it's, it's a little bit long, but it's got some really important concepts. So if you can hang with me here for a moment, we'll take a look at this. We must realize that this Greco-Roman culture, he's talking about ancient Rome. So the, the period uh, began in 747 BC 
and extend it for 1,260 years after that. So let me start again. We must realize that this Greco-Roman culture constituted a deep disillusionment for the Luciferic and Aramonic powers. The Luciferic and Aramonic powers of the hierarchy standing nearest to the human hierarchy desired that the Atlantean culture as it had been in Atlantis should simply reappear in the fourth post-Atlantean epoch. In other words, it was the intention of the Luciferic and Aramonic powers that everything that had constituted the essential nature of Atlantean culture should be merely repeated during the Greco-Roman age. This plan was frustrated inasmuch as humanity was raised to a higher stage consistent with the post-Atlantean era. What was essentially new and great in Greek and Roman culture constituted a spiritual disillusionment for the Luciferic and Aramonic powers. Through their different influences, these powers desired to educate the Greeks and so develop their powers of fantasy that the souls of men would gradually have become weary of the earth, would lose their inclination to incarnate further on the earth, and would tend to withdraw as souls from the earth in order to found a realm and planet of their own. The effect of this influence was annulled through the leadership of those powers we call the normal hierarchies, whereby the quality of fantasy and imagination in the Greeks which was also influenced, uh, which also influenced their social life, was transformed into joy in the earthly. The Greek received into his nature such a joy in the life of earth and of the senses that he had no desire to live merely in the world of imagination where his soul would be alienated from earthly existence, but inclined rather to the attitude expressed in the well-known words better to be a beggar on earth than a king in the realm of the shades. This joy in life between birth and death enabled the normal powers to avert from the Greeks the danger inherent in the plan of the Luciferic powers, namely to lead away the souls of men so that the bodies still to be born on the earth would have gone about without egos and their souls would have departed to a special planet of their own." End quote. So there you have it. And, you know, I'm sure that there are probably a few people that were watching this clicked away when I started that because it's, it reads to them like uh, some kind of uh, plot line out of Tolkien. And, uh, but actually, there is a, a, a parallel, so to speak. And that's that whole idea of the, the, role of the adversarial powers in current mankind. And, and because of the, our cyclical nature, we were, were the equal number of years past the mystery of Golgotha, the incarnation of Christ, as the Egyptians were before the incarnation of Christ. So that Rudolf Steiner talks about how we're recapitulating uh, the Egypto-Chaldean period in this current age of the consciousness soul. And when you get into understanding what that might mean, well, it becomes so profound. I've, I've posted links below uh, to, uh, there's a, a Wonders of the World uh, link below of Rudolf Steiner's lecture cycle that I, I just keep reading it over and over and over again because it really has some of the most important ideas that help you bring together many of the things that he shares within the body of his work. And so, uh, by the way, people that, that uh, purchase my books or donate uh, to buy a cup of coffee get included in my email mailings. I, I've never said that. I, I thought, well, maybe I should let people know because it just kind of happens to people that donate or, or buy my books. They, they get these uh, emails of things that I've cobbled together from uh, Anthroposophy. And so uh, it could be helpful. But there's, like I said, I put the links below. So if you really are, are diligent and want to pursue it further.
there wasn't a, a seamless transition that time. Um, Mary, um, um, I, th I think I know what you mean. I think I know what you mean. I disagree with you about you. I think you do know more than you realise. <clears throat> I think we all know and sense what's going on at a much deeper level than we want to admit to ourselves. Um, and, you know, it's a time jump. Yeah, the heart knows much more than the brain. And you know, I think if ever there was a time to reveal the truth of that, the time is now. Um, yeah, I mean, right. Paulie says, thank you very much for these emails, John. Because I, remember, I can't see any of this, and I don't know how much you can see, John. It's only when it appears in front of me. Right. Um, That's why I have to bring it up on the screen so that Reverend David can read it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just um, not well, intelligent. Um, all I'll say is um, all of these ancient systems, I don't include anthroposophy as one of these ancient systems. I, I would describe it more as the inheritor of deep knowledge from the past. I mean, I think it's unwise to dismiss any of it, Hermeticism, Platonism, um, Theosophy, um, in its traditional forms, before it got to Blavatsky, and I'm not writing off Blavatsky or the Theosophical Society, I've learned a great deal from them through the years. Um, I will say, you know, at the very least, all of these systems can very easily be seen as part of, of the psychology of religion, part of the psychology of, of the self, part of the, you know, the psychology of philosophy. Therefore, it's unwise to think there's no value to them or they're things that have lost value. You know, I mean, when, whenever somebody hears about Atlantis and the priesthoods back then, who were, were meant to be, of course, fighting this terrible battle between themselves, between the so-called White Lodge and the so-called Black Lodge, um, at the very least, those thoughts are arising out of the subconscious, out of our own minds, to describe things happening within us and around us. Therefore, I think it's incredibly unwise to suddenly think, dismiss all of that as, as irrelevant or archaic. Of course, some of us believe there's a lot more to it than that, and that these systems are not simply uh, uh, psychological. And that don't people mustn't get me wrong. Uh, the science of psychology, so-called, or is it an art, um, is an incredibly important development in human understanding and human affairs. Um, I suspect it's probably the oldest science as opposed to the newest. Um, and, you know, if we can go that far, then we can start talking about Hermeticism and Platonism in a recognisable form to those people. Uh, and maybe we can even agree with them to a large extent on what they're saying and, their, and the analysis that they're giving. Um, therefore, Steiner, as a clear adept, um, that's, again, not a word I tend to throw about, uh, as, a, as a champion of the good forces, uh, of the Christ current, uh, you know, the bearer of light. Uh, when he's saying, you know, hold on a second here, this is a time when we need to take note of where we are and what's happening around us. Uh, and if we don't, such and such will be the consequences, really is of paramount importance in the type of age we're living in at the moment. Uh, and part of that process, getting back to Mary, is to realize there are so many, so many forces, metaphysical and otherwise. Uh, and I like talking about the other, the otherwise a great deal. Boris, <coughs> Boris Johnson will know who I mean. There are so many people trying to hoodwink others nowadays, you know, that the young themselves, the millennials, uh, the next generations on the way up, cannot even see a reason in virtue. They can't see a reason to be good. They can't see the practical, down-to-earth, everyday necessity of trust, without which civilization and culture fall apart. You know, these are the darkest of times, and what is the best way to deal with them, in my view, becoming the best version of yourself that you can possibly dream and work at and maximizing your own joys, uh, maximizing pleasures with your family, your friends, 
seeing beauty in the world, seeing truth glittering all around us, and goodness will come out of that in the long run. What do you think, John? Yes, there is that. And it's uh, taken from another angle. You can uh, see how Rudolf Steiner, uh, he looks at it uh, from a different vantage point in, in uh, September 29th. And he's speaking, of course, to his period of time. You know, this is back in uh, 1917. And he says, the present age is more than any other age demanding the one thing people least want to have, understanding based on the science of the spirit. Strange as it may sound to the ordinary average people of today, order will not be created from the chaos of the present time until a sufficiently not large number of people are prepared to recognize the truth of that science. Such will be the karma of world history. Of course, he's referring to spiritual science. And I continue, quote, if people insist that this war is just like wars of the past, that will be making peace just as peace has been made before, let them talk. They are the people who love Maya, illusion, and do not distinguish between truth and deception. Let them make what may seem like peace. Order will only arise from the chaos that fills the world today when insight based on the science of the spirit dawns in human minds. You may feel in your heart that it will be a long time before such order comes. You may think it will be a long time before people are prepared to let the dawn of such a science arise, and you will be right. You have to accept that it will be a long time before order arises from the chaos, for it will not come until human hearts understand the realm of the spirit. Order can only come when it is understood how this chaos has arisen. Has arisen. Chaos has arisen because the reality is considered in an unspiritual way and the world of the spirit cannot be ignored with impunity. End quote. There's more, but I think that sufficiently makes a point, is that these, this whole idea of, of the struggle in the world and just using worldly resources to solve uh, these challenges, that's insufficient. And it, it becomes a question of, uh, it, enters into the realm of the amoral as you're as you were referring to because within that that way of thinking that you get this moral relativism as as, as a, a backdrop and that's very very unhealthy because the wholesome powers of the spiritual world are tied into these moral impulses on the most intimate level and so Rudolf Steiner mentions developing the powers of moral imagination, moral inspiration, and, and moral intuition. And so you see that, that that's the key there because the whole idea of bringing forth what will be our, our development in the next stage, the sixth post-Atlantean period, will be, as I've said on many occasions, built out of the concern and love for others. Well, we're pretty far away from that right now. So you have to know what time it is and you have to learn to be patient and like Rudolf Steiner says. And so you you can help your own personal relationship to it uh, in the sphere of the arts. And here's a, here's a poem by a, a poet that I like, uh, A.E., George William Russell. He was a, a very significant, uh, theosophist and poet and friend of uh, many people, uh, William Butler Yeats, James Joyce, uh, it goes on and on. But in his book, uh, Homeward, Songs by the Way, from 1901, he has a poem that I used to recite, enjoyed reciting at our, our uh, romantic futurist events where we'd have art and poetry and music and all of that. It's a poem entitled, The Great breath. 
Its edges foam with amethyst and rose, withers once more the old blue flower of day. There where the ether like a diamond glows, its petals fade away. A shadowy tumult stirs the dusky air, sparkle the delicate dews, the distant snows. The great deep thrills, for through it everywhere, the breath of beauty blows. I saw how all the trembling ages passed, molded to her by deep and deeper breath, nearer to the hour when beauty breathes her last and knows herself in death. I've always been a huge admirer of A.E., uh, particularly the paintings. Um, I tend to have a rather withering attitude to a lot of the poetry that came out of that particular period. Um, I certainly jump. Yeah, I, uh, I have a friend that I used to know when I was managing the bookstore. Of course, we were the largest esoteric bookstore in the world. I met all kinds of people. But there was a, a gentleman, Darwin. He was uh, from Canada. And he was collecting the original paintings of A.E. And he had, the, he had the largest collection in the world. And I have a catalog of his collection somewhere here, but I didn't know we were gonna talk about it, so I can't go squirreling around looking for it. But uh, yeah, he, uh, I, I sold him my copy of, uh, of Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, the first edition, you know, with in a nice green with the, the sigils of the different regions of the Celtic world on the spine from Oxford University by, Evans Wentz, and who also did the, that wonderful edition of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Uh, so yeah, there's very interesting uh, developments with A.E. He, he's even made fun of by James Joyce, uh, in a sense, him and, him and Yeats and, and company in uh, Ulysses, that the most uh, significant novel that nobody reads <laughs> but he uh, he read it aloud at shakespeare and company our, our friends who who listen to this podcast in paris hello paris and uh but in looking at that and, and but he's an interesting character this james joyce because he struggled and he was a brilliant uh mind uh he was at a reading that he was doing at Shakespeare and Company, and there were people there from all all directions in Europe. And at the end of the the session, he was he was fielding questions from the audience, and there's people speaking all these various European languages, and he would answer answer them back in their language. <laughs> And, and all the other people are saying, you know, they're trying to translate it so that they can all follow the conversation that's going along. But he, he basically was, was uh, fluent in, in most of the modern European languages, in addition to Latin and Greek and all that stuff that you get out of a certain type of education. But yet he uh, is a good example of somebody who was struggling with the abstract mind. And so you see Stephen Dedalus in, in Ulysses uh, trying to struggle through the world and Molly Bloom and, and that whole interesting thing. But the, in fact, uh, it was uh, Joseph Campbell wrote a, a book, uh, The Skeleton Key, uh, and uh, it's a skeleton key to James Joyce. And so you see that it's difficult because he he is like uh, Ezra Pound, I'd say, is 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 another one because they'll make allusions to things in the way they turn a phrase or what have you, and the only ones that are going to catch that they did that are the specialists within that field who even know who he's quoting, you know, whether Lucius or 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 
Rimbo or some, you know, just some obscure reference that he'll he'll make a reference to in the way he says things, so that uh, it, there's people that have built their academic careers and try to decipher exactly what he's talking about, you know. And you also have the Maxis poems that that are another uh, modernist example of that type of approach, like with Ezra Pound and his cantos. And so you see that that whole idea of to be able to contextualize within this this ever expanding vista, and of course the real hero in the inklings of of that view is Owen Barfield, and uh, his history in words and uh, the the his whole idea that he came up with the idea of the evolution of consciousness before he ever even heard of Rudolf Steiner, and then when he finally was confronted with his work ended up becoming one of the translators at that time of Rudolf Steiner's lectures and was the one who exposed the work of Rudolf Steiner to other members of the Inklings, including J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and Charles Williams and uh, T.S. Eliot was also another person that came into the sphere of Rudolf Steiner's work. And in fact, when T.S. Eliot went and, and talked on uh, German radio, he said, he, he, and I paraphrase because I don't want to go looking for it. He said, I see the way forward as, as, as that outlined by Dr. Rudolf Steiner. And so you see that uh, there is a hope and, and you have to be able to, to find the beauty in the world and let that inspire you to, to bring love to the world. And that, that was the way in which the adversarial powers were dealt with in the Greco-Roman period. And while we can't do it quite the same way as they did, uh, we'd have one heck of a party. But <laughs> nonetheless, that, that, that now is the time to be able to, to set aside certain features of, of the way in which it was approached then and, and become more refined in our development uh, as far as aesthetic is concerned. And so you see the the high points of it within the realms of music and art and all of that, that, that it's just, a, a, you know, it's a truly a Gertian approach to culture. Well, as a, as a gay man, I don't believe in a gay agenda um, unless I, I'm the only one that's been left, I, I've been left out of it if there is one. So no, can somebody please tell me where it is so I can sign up and get my 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 portion? Um, I'm saying that because of a Woody Allen remark. You know, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore all men are homosexual. Um, to which I can't remember which movie it came from. To which he said, well, no, no, not all men are homosexual, but they must have, I'm paraphrasing, they must have had some wild parties, which... <laughs> which I never thought of before that movie. Um, yeah, I mean, oh, I'm not having a go at A.E. I actually like A.E.'s poetry. I think some of the sort of so-called mystical poetry, and certainly not Yeats, you know, the master poet himself, you know, some of the so-called mystical poetry uh, from that milieu, from that circle, is just appallingly sentimental as opposed to evocative. Um Oh, hang on, right. Uh, Oswald's just written, they don't let ever the readers into the Lebanon. <laughs> oh, God. Well, there we are, left out again. Oh, always the bridesmaid, but never the bride. <laughs> um, <coughs> oh, well, there we are. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, gosh, I mean, I actually have, John. You know, bring it up. It's a, a jewel. Julius Evelas, who he's referring to, is a traditionalist writer. And if you read Evelas, I mean, he's really uh, quite a, a remarkable writer in the, in the clarity in which he writes. He's, he's in that group of traditionalists with Rene Ganon and all that. There's a, there's a shift in emphasis, though, because when, when asked, uh, as far as Evelas' uh, spiritual quest, he said it was a quest for power. See, and that that's like the big red herring right there, is that well, that's that neo-feudalist tendency that, that that we don't care for and and yet we have friends that that have 
kind of a sentimental relationship with it, shall we say. And so, yeah, that's, that's, there's been a shift. I thought you handled that very well, actually. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I knew Everla. I haven't read all of Everla. I've read some of Everla. I mean, very impressive work, gifted writer, you know, an iron will, beautiful metaphors. Um, the metaphysics of sex is simply wrong. And it's, you know, I'm right. Why am I right? Because I'm telling you I'm right. No, 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 no. <clears throat> um, <laughs> um, so therefore, when he, when he drops a, a clanger, he really can drop a clanger. Some of it's breathtakingly inspiring. I knew he had this sort of Nietzschean bent to him, um, which is, oh, I mean, is it real Nietzsche or is it what people want Nietzsche to say, which, of course, has got into the system, so nobody's questioning what Nietzsche said anymore, John. Well, yeah, yeah, that's kind of passe, but, but people still tend to quote him, you know, like... Uh... That which doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. I mean, you hear that in pop songs, right? But uh, no, it's interesting because of the the uh, developments over the last uh, thirty years or so in the research into the effect of of Nietzsche's sister, uh, Forster Nietzsche, that she uh, Elizabeth Forster Nietzsche, that she, she was the editor of his works and that. Actually, it's now believed, due to certain uh, characteristics, that she actually composed uh, some of his later works. And but she, of course, she's the one with the, the the dodgy ties to the the National Socialists and and that whole thing. And, and so it it gets very dark and it's it's it difficult because uh, Nietzsche was a profound individual, and I I think that one of the greatest books in the history of ideas is The Birth of Tragedy, which was his per first book where he blew on the scene and everybody went, whoa, because he showed the, the kind of the balancing act in, in the Greco-Roman uh, themes of the Apollonian stream and the Dionysian stream. And so that's something that we're going to be approaching over the next few episodes, which is why I sent you the Wonders of the World PDF. And I see that uh, uh, people here uh, in our, our little neighborhood, our little private neighborhood here, uh, yeah, like this here, Mary. Yes, those emails, like on Wonders of the World, help me. So thank you so much. And that, that Wonders of the World... Uh, lecture cycle that I made reference to earlier is, is something that I've just, you have to understand what my relationship with Rudolf Steiner's works is that I have a tendency to read things over and over and over and over again, because you can go back and you can read a Steiner lecture that you've read 30 times, and then you go back and read it again. And it's almost as if you've never read it before. And that's because this time when you come to it, you're different. It's it's stayed the same, but you're different. And so it's 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 something that has its own morphology within the the, the view of ideas. And that gets in that whole idea of what is a group relationship. And Rudolf Steiner says that as we move toward the future, that and I, I'm paraphrasing conceptually uh, rather than quoting him, but if, if you look at the whole idea of this group thing without ego that, that he was making reference to the Luciferic path. And that's, that's that, that uh, Shivite thing like with Julius Evola. And uh, the, it's a negation of, of the Christ impulse. And so it doesn't embrace exactly what that means within the, the relevance of, of the ego and wanting to constellate you into this group with, with somebody in charge is giving up your individuality, giving up your humanity, basically, and going to this Luciferic paradise, so to speak. So that when you look at this more closely, then you see that you, you uh, are approaching 
uh, some very profound dramas. And so that's a theme that I think we're going to be reapproaching as we move into the future on these episodes, because it's always nice to have something you can think about during the week. I will I will catch up with that reading. At the moment, I've got a deadline for my own new book, uh, which you will be receiving shortly, Mr. Barnwell, to write the preface. Um, so that's, you know, on top of everything else, that's why I'm, I'm behind with my reading at the minute. I did make time to read Guido von List because I think he's one, I always suspected he was one of those people that needs rehabilitating. Um, and from what I've been reading, he seriously does. You know, everybody's got an opinion, but nobody's actually looking at the, the primary sources. And he's just in the wrong time frame to be a national socialist at the end. So, you know, he's part of a much greater cultural revival that, uh, you know, of which that was one of the manifestations. But certainly that probably wasn't the manifestation he was aiming at, John. Well, it's kind of the hijacking of, of the, the artistic uh, works of, of Richard Wagner, right? Because if you remember, we discussed previously the, the operas of, of Richard Wagner and the, and the role they played in the social milieu. And mind you, uh, previously to that uh, period of time, the mythos of, of the North, you know, with the, with the, the Kalevala and, and all the, the Edda and all these various poetic remains were not available and people weren't familiar with them and they didn't really know much about it. They, the basis of their understanding of the world was what was what they received in the, as a culture around the church. So they weren't getting into explaining what the religious practices of the, of the so-called Vikings were, you know, and so you have that. Uh, coming into a, a twilight and, and it's it's in the myths themselves the the, the myth of ragnarok and the, that whole idea of this this great ending and and so it, it's very relevant because that which was being carried through those northern cultures was tr coming to a climate terror coming to an ending and a culmination and of course that made them uh really fertile ground for the the taking up of the Christian impulse because they weren't even involved in the Greco-Roman intellectual development and what had been coming out of, out of the various nations around the Mediterranean, that, that, that they weren't in on that. They were up in the north and their, the, the expression of their mysteries was artistic. And it was, it was uh, Rudolf Steiner talks about how it was in the sphere of music that the, the, the bedrock was created for the future development of science and music. And so you look at music and I challenge anybody to say that there's a higher expression of music than the German romanticists. I mean, you know, come on, when you look at, and, and not just Germans, but it's that whole expression, that Northern European musical development that came through with, with Bach and Beethoven and Wagner. And, and so it's something that cannot be denied. And, and so it, it's interesting because music is a very uh, wholesome approach to truth because you could play music and, and it will express to you uh, certain truths regarding the world within the realm of feelings. And, but it leaves you free within the realm of thinking, unless of course there's a libretto and it's an opera, so that uh, it, it's a freeing experience. It's, it's an artistic experience that can inspire you in a direction, perhaps mythically, but that's going to make this uh, earth a worthwhile place to be, to where one can develop as one works towards the goal of, of human evolution. I mean, people tend to forget you know, the, 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 the writings of, of Beethoven as a theologist. I mean, he wrote voluminously on theology and God and, and morals and so on. I mean, that needs to be recovered. Um, I, I'm actually one of those weirdos that's read Ulysses. 
um, and admire it a great deal. It is disconcerting, but, uh, you know, the first reading tends to deliver, I think, the thought pretentious. The, the second reading really starts revealing the depth of the man's insight and knowledge. Um, yeah, and the fact at the end of the day, it's love which saves us all. I mean, that, you know, it, it seems a hackneyed thing to say outside of the novel. Read the novel, it's beautiful. If you haven't done, my dear friends here, you know, read it, it's beautiful. Don't be put off by it. Um, the great experiment with language is doing what he does best, and it's... I would say it's worthwhile. I'd say everyone was reading it. I used to have a copy. Um, oh, no, since I was talking about poets, I mean, I've actually written about Ezra Pound. I have a great respect for Ezra Pound. Um, and, yeah, the, I, th I think the erudition of these things needs to come back, not be abandoned or forgotten. You know, why are we all patronising each other, although we don't have <laughs> intellectual capacities? That's what the these so-called hierarchies want us to think that we've got nothing to offer, that we've got nothing that we can't think, that we can't feel. It's just not true. We're children of the most high. We can think, we can feel, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're incredible beings. Um, and there's so much now pouring this, these negative images onto the working man and woman. Uh, you know, that you're, you're just this, you're just that, you're a sir. And it really has to stop because if anything, the last couple of centuries proved all that was nonsense. Um, certainly in terms of Evans Wentz, I mean, I used to have the fairy faith in Celtic countries as well as his version, as well as his work on Buddhism, but it was stolen somewhere along the way. Thank you, everyone that used to do that to me, borrow books without telling me and never returning them. I think it's called an act of theft, but there we are. Uh, must get them back at some point. Um, Gosh, I mean, yeah, I'm haunted by the, the gay lifestyle thing. Um, there's a pastor in America, Brandon. I admire him a great deal, although even he is talking about the, the gay lifestyle. Is it only me that doesn't have it? Um, you know, it, I was th thinking at one point in my own past of becoming a Metropolitan Community Church minister and writing pithy things about Kelvin. Um, largely because I rather admire Kelvin. Um, and I, I suspect there's a much deeper level to all this predestination stuff than people realise. Um, I mean, his writings are way before genetics. His writings are way before probability theory. But really, those are the moulds within which Kelvin couches his thoughts on mystical doctrines. Uh, you know, the, the, the great mystery that we're free, but we're not free. Um, certainly that's something I'd have liked to look at a great deal more. And, you know, I think it shows to me the power of literature and the power of mysticism when they can join. Uh, poetry is the great liberator. It always has been and it always will be. Um, as I say, I don't want to attack too much the poets of that particular time, or the authors of that particular time, some of whom were drawing on very deep resources, some of whom patently were not. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think we need to, as I was saying to Mary early, we need to remember what we are. We, we're, we're not creations. Uh, if we're using the sort of evangelical speak, Adam and Eve were crea creations of God. We are not creations of God. We are the descendants of those creations. Therefore, all of the things that went wrong, we inherit, if you're looking in that sort of paradigm. Um, I think there's a lot to that, in, particularly in terms of poetry, predestination, and where we all go from here. Because really, there are very few alternatives to spiritual science, which needs to be taken very, very closely into our personal remit at the moment, into our personal thoughts. Just a few um, sort of dreamy thoughts there, John, handing back. Yes, uh, it, it has to do with, uh, what do they say? The devil is in the details. <laughs> and uh, cursory readings of, of certain things will not glean you very much. And so it's, 
that's why I like I'm I, I can't even keep track of how many times I've uh, listened to and read uh, and I have the book I have a PDF that I translated and edited with footnotes myself that I sent out to people on my email list people that bought books or donated and also the its presence uh, on the Rudolf Steiner archive and and uh, listening to it on YouTube and just going back over and over because it's so fundamental in understanding the challenge of overcoming the adversarial powers and but it's nothing that that is meant to be f fanatical and Rudolf Steiner's very adamant about that and I'll get in uh, perhaps in another episode explaining that because it's something again I, I alluded to many many episodes ago the difference between shall and must <laughs> so if you decide that you're going to do something it's not the same as if you're when you're made to do it because that's the rules and so uh but that that whole idea that's the rules you have to follow along makes us despondent it creates that that kind of terminal ennui the effect uh just uh, read uh, Solzhenitsyn, you know, <laughs> that is Gulag uh, Archipelago, you know, and that will give you some idea of the challenges of, of being in a world uh, of forlorn grayness. It reminds me of uh, a book on, uh, uh, it, it, on the uh, NDE, and uh, George Ritchie's book on, on near-death experience. And, and he tells a story of a, a soldier who went to a concentration camp and they noticed there was all these like really uh, unhealthy prisoners. And there was one prisoner there that was ministering to the other uh, people, and, but he looked healthy. And so that was like, you know, what, what was it? And it turns out that he was a Christian and he spent his time there helping other people. And that whole approach to the world was, was what led him to be nourished. It wasn't that he had different food or anything like that. And so you see that these are very real things. And, and uh, the whole idea of, of blessing your food before you eat it can can give you a chance to reconnect with that source of inspiration because you could find Christ is all around you. And so that's, I think, the, the thrust of what we're trying to share. And there's a lot of different approaches that one can make regarding that. But in the final analysis, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I mean, amen. I think people tend to take the Bible at face value, which is a shame. I mean, I one of my uh, one of the elements of my work is is, is basically what I've called uh, our great ancestral faith, where I'm not sure there were different religions. It seems to be the same religion taken different angles that informs us as a people, and it, I you know it nourishes by by what it is. Um, Certainly, we need these conversations, John. You know, I've suddenly remembered the heat is killing me. Where I was getting to with those previous comments, <coughs> we need to remember the difference between fantasy and imagination, uh, because there are great, vast differences between those things. We also need to resuscitate and revive our view of fantasy. I mean, I'm always moaning on this program about the fact that most people are in the grip of fantasy. Um, and they're cheap fantasies too. They're not expensive ones. Um, and the, you know how terrible it is. Glamour, as Alice Bailey would have called it. We're in the grip of glamour where we can't see anything apart from our own desires, which is largely what fantasy is. I mean, it's not an act of creation, which is what imagination tends to be. But, you know, again, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, the Odyssey by Homer certainly would have been an act of imagination which is true even though it's not true. So you start getting onto new philosophical grounds 
the minute great epics like that are, are, are contextualized, you know, how can something that's a work of fiction uh, be so true? I mean, you know, and the fact that there are more books written on Hamlet than most ordinary people, but he's a fictional character. Um, and the King of Elfland's Daughter. I remember reading that as a work of, I mean, it starts the whole modern fantasy genre. Remember reading that delightful story many years ago and thinking how utterly intriguing it was. So this is how far the desire life can go, John. Well, you might want to add, in case somebody doesn't know, The King of Elfland's Daughter is a, a, uh, a book by Lord Dunsany, who's regarded by many people, including like Robert E. Howard, the author of Conan, to be the, basically the father of fantasy literature. Yeah, but that interesting story, the, yeah, the, the King of Elfland's Daughter, I'll give you a short one paragraph synopsis. The, the daughter of, uh, of the King of Elfland decides she longs to be down here with mortals. And so she goes down there and she ends up getting stuck working in a, in a sewing, at a sewing machine. <laughs> and uh, in a dr life of drudgery. And so, uh, what, her name was what? Lirazel. And uh, had a cat named Lirazel after. But anyway, so going back, just to, it, it enriches what you were saying. Well, I mean, yeah, if for me it was a, a, a revelation, as I say, to see how detailed and delicate and intricate our own reflections are. You know, fantasy for me is like looking in a mirror. And it's like looking in the mirror of not of something. It's like looking in the mirror that only reflects or largely reflects our own desires. You know, what we want the world to be, what the world should be to us if we were limited beings. If we were only the type of human beings that the, the present sciences are describing. If we're only apes, if we're only tiny organisms in this inhuman machine, you know, this vast cosmic mechanism which has no relation to us at all, which doesn't care about us. Um, and it led to other things. I mean, I'm a great admirer of Michael Moorcock. I don't know if you know him, John, you know, swords and sorcery, um, mostly. Um, and, you know, but there are science fantasy, not science fiction. I hate these modern reviewers where they can't even see the difference between supernatural tales, science fiction tales and fantasy tales. I mean, it seems to be far too complex for them. You know, if they can't do the job, please give up the job and let someone who can do it do it better. Um, but certainly, I mean, his oeuvre, and that's not too much... <laughs> You know, that's, that's the word that's only used for a great writer. I'm actually willing to stick my neck out and say he does deserve that word. I mean, Dancers at the End of Time, uh, the trilogy of time travellers, where everyone at the end of time, in a world where their science has become so powerful, it's tantamount to magic, you know, where they've all become personalities. What else could you do uh, to delight each other uh, in the company that they keep? My favourite, um, there, I mean, there's so much I love in that, in those, in that trilogy. Uh, my favourite bit is where the, the personalities at the end of time, one of my favourite bits, go back to meet the Café Royale set with Oscar Wilde. And surprise, surprise, they all get on like a, like a, like a, you know, like a hand in a glove. Um, and it's just one of those delightful moments that you wouldn't get in any other type of writing. Um, the, my, one of my favourite ends to that particular scene being um, the last of all scientists, Branagh Morphile, a great name, who's got a hunchback and a club foot, the traditional signs of a scientist, uh, because all the records, I mean, it's so distant in the future, all the records are basically gone. So, they, you know, they've got inklings of what used to happen in the past, but not much more than that. Um, actually suddenly appears in the Café Royale upside down with a portable time machine, I believe from the 43rd century, where they, they basically sacrifice workmanship to cost effectiveness. And he's floating upside down moaning about the fact that this cheap time device is ruining his entry. 
and he's threatening everybody uh, from the future. You don't understand. You'll all be ejected to different parts of, of the continuum. You better leave now for your own good. Then he suddenly disappears. And it's basically they're all toasting each other with champagne. Um, you know, so is fantasy unimportant? No, it's not. But what I am saying is that we're more than creatures that need fantasy. We're, we're creatures with a cosmic design inside of us. We need imagination and creativity, and we need to stretch way beyond, not to the exclusion of, but way beyond seeing ourselves in a clinical mirror, in a, in a limited mirror of need, because we can see ourselves as reflections of so many other things. Have you ever read him, John? No, I've only heard of him. I'm looking for something here. I tend to get so many things going that, that things get misplaced. And uh, But I wanted to share uh, with our listening and viewing audience, as I try to do every week, but I don't forget, as we're here with the Reverend David William Perry, and this is his first book, The Grammar of Witchcraft. And it's a uh, Shakespearean study. It's not a grimoire. And his second volume is Caliban's Redemption, his Shakespearean poetry. And his major work at this point, although he's not done yet, Mount Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg, and the Arts. And that's edited by the talented Daniela Hadi you're induced and uh, who just recently published his book on Waldorf education. There's a, a link below for anybody that wants to check it out. Uh, it can be found below with, with the other links. It's, and uh, But the title of the book is On the Philosophy of Education Towards an Anthroposophical View. And you have a link, you can get a free Kindle copy or you can buy a paper copy like I did. Although now I, I think it's in the other room. That's what happens when you read books, you set them down where you are. And so, uh, and for my, and uh, of course their books are available on Amazon and I wholeheartedly uh, recommend you check them out. And as for myself, I have two books. The first book is Arcana of the Grail Angel, the Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail. A study developed out of the work of Ross Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the true Rosicrucian Order. And that's some 640 pages with extensive diagrams based upon the work handwritten work of Aaron Pfeiffer, the founder of Biodynamic Gardening. And, uh, but I have all those diagrams, plus a great many more in my second volume, which is Arcana of Light on the Path. And so in these, you can get these uh, in the continental US on eBay, or you can contact me directly through private message on Facebook or through the academia link below. Also in the academia link below, you can download a free PDF of the forward by the noted astrosopher and psychologist uh, William Bento, my old friend, the late Willie Bento, and of blessed memory. And so uh, also, if you'd like to uh, buy us a cup of coffee, that's uh, for Reverend David, paypal.me forward slash d Perry777 for myself, paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. And like I said, people that get my books or, or donate, uh, they'll be put on the email list to receive the uh, edits that I put together, articles and different things that people have enjoyed over the years that we've been doing this podcast. It's just I never told anybody that was going to happen, but that's okay. And so here we are, and I'm thinking at this point uh, of just handing it back to David 
and seeing if we could segue uh, gradually, ever so gradually, because we're not done. We got a, we got another fifteen minutes or so, and uh, but I'm sure he has something to share. Um, gosh, yeah, I think uh, anthroposophical works need to be discussed openly on this show. Uh, not only your own stalwart work, uh, but other anthroposophists. Uh, do I regard my own work as anthroposophic? Anthroposophy? No, I regard it as anthroposophically inspired. I mean, certainly, uh, Caliban's Redemption actually grew out of something. I, well, one of the things it grew out of at that particular time was I was reading about spiritual science at that particular time. Um, and it had a, an influence on that book. So that needs to be borne in mind. You know, anthroposophy is such fertile soil. It gives birth to innumerable, innumerable creations in, in innumerable ways. We've suddenly been hit by a gust of heat out of nowhere. So that's why I'm flagging fast at the minute. There's no particularly other reason for that. You know, it's a nice sunny day. Uh, the trees are rippling a little, but, you know, every now and again, that sudden deadening heat suddenly arrived um yeah i mean what back to fantasy uh for a minute because i like reading uh, montague summers i don't regard him as a fantasy writer uh father summers of course was an old catholic um i don't know why he didn't fight back when the romans suddenly said well where were you ordained then bitch um which which, I mean, he was so rude about them. They had every right to do that. And it it always confuses me. Why didn't he just say yada, 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 which he didn't? Um, John. I think the word is impetuous. <laughs> yes, yes. <sir. laughs> um, you, know, you know, that's, I mean, those are meant to be phenomenological studies of the supernatural. Um, and it's in, I mean, it's not badly written. It's not stayed. They're beautifully written. They're, they're deep and rich texts. Uh, but of course, he's also weaving narrative into that, his own t interpretation uh, of, of what theology meant in his period, which isn't really what most other people thought it was. Um, and his own view of these things. You know, I, I wish. <sighs> I wish anthroposophists could bridge the gap present company accepted, obviously. And, you know, this is the type of material we deal with. That isn't the type of material we really look at because the richness and depth of anthroposophy is, is, is you know, is paramount to anybody that even gets slightly involved with it. I mean, it, it, it staggers me. Um, another, I, the reason I mentioned that, which I've got no time to work on at the minute. I'll just finish this one, John, is I'm currently writing a short story about a ghoul um, based loosely on the Highgate vampire. Have you heard of the Highgate vampire? Um, it's the, is there a Highgate vampire? I don't know. You know, but it's not just some old guy waiting for a bus. I'm sorry, no, that won't work, right? Uh, apparently, every now and again, this guy... <laughs> With a with a purple like complexion, oh, give me a break! Do you know the amount of pubs in that particular area? So you know this this purple looking tall thin thing is seen leaping over hedges, probably because there's not a toilet to hand. You know, I mean, and so I, I suddenly thought the other day, well, that sounds a bit more like a ghoul to me than a vampire. So I'm I'm playing with that idea at the minute. And it will have a the an anthroposophical streak. Um, when Steiner is talking about those powers, <coughs> excuse me, that hold us back and that hold us down, those demonic entities, energies that have been expelled once and for all from the higher realms, what what the creative community, it strikes me, isn't doing at the minute, is using those ideas to the greatest possible effect. Um, you know, this is the anthroposophical way of writing. Why? Why? Whoever said that? And that's certainly not what the original anthroposophists did. I mean, as you know, as well as I do, John, that was a glittering array of people that surrounded Rudolf Steiner in back in the day. And why can't we withdraw, you know, why can't we draw on those resources again? What do you think? 
Yes, it's um, it becomes a, a a challenge. What is what is that? Uh, an enigma wrapped inside a riddle or wrapped inside a mystery. And so there's always that that effect. And and that's the history effect too, because you can look back and you can eulogize uh, uh, historical periods looking back. And you're not seeing all the tough stuff like, well, yeah, but they didn't have any bathrooms. You know, it's like, <laughs> it seems to get glazed over uh, as people eulogize and, uh, <laughs> So it's a, that's that's pretty funny, uh, but uh, we're running toward the end of our journey here. And David, I I don't want to expend all of your energy. I'm sure you have projects you're working on, especially your new book. Uh, what's this? Uh, is it true that you're are you good to uh, accept the the uh, position of chief editor of the London Post? Is it? Yeah. Um... Out of the blue, um, that shows the sort of circle I move in. Out of the blue, um, I was approached uh, uh, mid last week um, by the board of the London Post, not London Post. London Post is this Russian owned rag, um, which only, only ever talks about salacious nonsense. It, uh, this is the whole Boris Johnson effect. You can even see it now, a team of lawyers, expensive lawyers in court, saying the names are completely different, Your Honour. You know, it, it's got to stop all this. Um, so, yeah, the London Post um, contacted me and said, OK, you know, what are you doing at the minute? Uh, actually, a lot is happening at the minute. We've got the, the grammar of witchcraft being put on as a play. Uh, we've got the Nephilim Anthropology Conference coming up. Um, and I've got the book. I mean, I think Gwendolyn is probably going to start sending missiles in my direction, unless I other, send them. But other than that, you're not busy. <laughs> but apart from that, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I was approached, uh, you know, would you consider being, would you consider accepting the role as uh, ch uh, uh, chief editor? Um, and, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's very, very flattering, and I'm sure we're probably all reaching a chord. At the moment, um, we're stuck on terms and conditions um, since this has to become an income stream. I'm sorry. Um, and, you know, also I will want my say very clearly as the chief editor about what we do and what we don't do. Um, therefore, I don't want salacious nonsense, you know, that will that won't differentiate us from London Post. So... I'm optimistic that, that yes, uh, we will reach an agreement, but I don't think it will be for another week, another half a week, another week, because they've got to come up with a package that makes it worthwhile for me and agree that uh, we support John Barnwell in all of his works and everything he does. John? Well, that goes without saying, and, I, and you know, I, I wish you only the best in all of your endeavors, of course. And... Uh, so that's that's an interesting uh, turn of events out of the blue, I, and I thought that uh, our regular listeners would love hearing about that. Even if you don't ex end up doing it, it's cool that you got asked. Oh, I, I, I'm confident something will work out. I mean, part of the problem was the previous chief editor, uh, Dr. Qureshi, who, who I knew he was a friend of mine. Uh, kept all of the codes, I mean, mostly it's online nowadays, kept all of the codes and all of the information people need to break him, break into his emetic system. Um, but it was decided, and he passed on very quickly. That was, that was Shahid passed on quickly. Nobody's quite sure why. Very sad turn of events. Um, and he was known as a hard-hitting political and cultural commentator. Um, certainly, I wouldn't want to let him down. Uh, and yes, I mean, uh, I think that will happen, but it also, they must give me, the board must be willing to say, look, there are certain people I'd like to regularly invite to contribute uh, to the London Post and really say, you know, what their take on the current situation is, the world and its, and its needs and its wants. And then if they agree to that and there's a tiny, a modest income stream for me, I'm sure, uh, we can all come to some greater accord. As I say, it looks likely. It looks likely.
Yeah, Agatha Velvet says, they'd be lucky to have you, David. You're worth the big bucks. He, he. Okay, well, you didn't have to put the he, he on there, but I get your point. I am worth the big bucks. I haven't got any. <laughs> I'm, I'm I must admit, I'm tired of being a poor minister at 64. Like, you know, isn't there a, any mercy in all of this? Uh, particularly because I've had enough of London and my partner and I want to move elsewhere. So we need some income. Yeah, yeah. Being an itinerant mendicant. Um, oh, God, if only the, the churchy stuff had worked out in the way I really wanted it to. But I think that's a, a mystery for another world. We'll just have to, to pass on to that. Do I do the prayer now, John? Because I can't see the time. Yeah, that's, that's, that sounds... Uh, I, I, one more thing before we do that. Yeah. Uh, it's something I like to do is uh, let people know that this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of Tyla, uh, Vadim, Vivian, Neil, Christian, Mark, Ma, Drupman, Laura, Paula, Rick, Michael, Beth, Ishtar, Anna, and so many others over the years. And I want to thank you all for supporting our humble efforts. And thank in advance all those people that contribute to get onto my uh, email list. And so go ahead, David. Was I correct in hearing the name of a goddess as one of our supporters? My God, that's an honor. That's an honor. Thank you. Um, oh, what's been on my mind all week? All this, all this Calvinist stuff. All this Calvinist stuff. I'm beginning. Why? I mean, finding a true partner's predestination, suddenly being offered the chief, the chief editorship of a, a respected newspaper out of the blue. Predestination. Predestination's on my mind at the minute. How free are we? And is that important if it's thrilled them to God? Um, are we really, really caught in the hand of God to that secure level? I don't know. But it's on my mind a lot at the minute. So I suppose, John. Well, it gets into uh, what efficient causation and, and dependent causation and some of the things that are struggled with. In Buddhist uh, texts, uh, you know, uh, that there's no, uh, everything is dependent causation. Yeah. Right? You exist because something else uh, took action, you know. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. That there is that, but the, see, uh, that, and, and just taking that as a, as a kind of nonlinear statement, okay, fine, but. It's when we can view that within the context of a cosmology. And that's that's the missing element, is that, that time mystery that Rudolf Steiner reveals, that he says that it's the language of Christ, that it gives us a, a, a way of being able to understand the mystery of time. Well, well certainly time and dependency have been on my mind a lot. Um, for, uh, not, not just those reasons, for other reasons too. I suppose it's getting slightly old as partly it too. Um, and it amazed me because I always thought that the theologist Friedrich Schleiermacher, who I've got a huge respect for, uh, I mean, you don't really get romanticism without him, uh, this giant, giant of theology, giant of German theology. I mean, he's really where the, the whole idea of dependency is formulated in the modern world. But going back to Calvin, gosh, it's, it's there. It's there, this desperate, beautiful dependency on higher powers. So when I, 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 I'm not going to do one of my extempore prayers. I'd like to read a prayer to you uh, by some of the early Calvinists. It's called the Prayer of Surrender. Uh, my dear friends, until we all meet again, may the Lord Jesus Christ take all my freedom my understanding and my will all that i have and cherish you have given to me and i know i surrender it all to be guided by your will your love and your grace are wealth enough for me give me these lord jesus and i ask for nothing more than being with me until we all meet again, God bless you.
Amen, and God bless you all. And may you enjoy the weather. Even if it is hot. <laughs>